we're happy to welcome many of our New York colleagues and friends to this symposium, this very, very special occasion that is hosted by Teachers College and co-sponsored by the Children's Aid Society and the New York City, the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. So their banner is over there and we're very grateful to them for uh, sending out an announcement about this event and bringing so many of you out here. I can't see the balcony because of all the lights, but I know that it's very, very full. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Judy Diamond, who is a trustee of the Children's Aid Society, Society and a very ardent supporter and key champion of community schools. Judy? I know you can hear me. Can you see me? <laughs> kind of short. Jane, thank you. Uh, now that I've moved back to New York, it's uh, so great to be working again with my friends and colleagues uh, at the Children's Aid Society who have been so instrumental in the success of the National Community School Movement. And um, I just love seeing all of you here because I know <clears throat> that you're on the front lines of this movement, um, doing all the heavy lifting, and there is an awful lot of it, and hanging in there to make sure that these kids uh, beat seemingly impossible odds. So thank you all for being here today. I'm also extremely pleased and proud to introduce, I can't believe this, the United States Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan. <laughs> and I knew him when. <laughs> to this special audience, all of whom are dedicated to filling the responsibility gap that prevents millions of America's youth from achieving success in school and in life. Many educational leaders are equipped with outstanding intellects, knowledge, and experience. And Arnie is certainly one of them. There are even a significant number who have the capacity to inspire collaboration and collective resolve among the most diversified of groups. And Arnie is among the best of them. But there are only a select few who seem to have an instinct instinctual drive to dedicate their lives to fighting day in and day out for these kids' futures. And it is this instinct that really sets Arnie apart and compels him to make the bold and tough decisions that produce powerful results and have it, that he has achieved over the course of his career. In Chicago, he closed schools that needed to be closed, restructured others, pioneered new schools, and tested innovative solutions to pressing problems. Creating community schools was a critical part of this strategy. During his tenure, Arne transformed over 150 of the district's 600 public schools into vibrant centers of their communities. Each of these schools was paired with a lead partner agency, a community-based organization that brought human and financial resources to the school's students, families, and teachers. To launch and sustain these community schools, Arnie tapped into private foundation support and combined these grants with the district dollars to create a high highly leveraged pool of funding that enabled us to reach scale. He also did a masterful job of bringing these resources to bear on student success. Today, Arnie is here to tell you more about the circumstances and outcomes of this work and how his commitment to community schools is reflected 
in the priorities, policies, systems, and incentive structures of his administration. After hearing what he has to say, I think you will agree that this Secretary of Education has provided this group of pioneers with an unprecedented opportunity to change the odds for America's most vulnerable youth. Now we need to rise to the challenge and realize this vision. And so, without talking any further, and without any further ado, it is my very, very great pleasure to introduce to you the United States Secretary of Education, Arnie Dank. to be here. Judy, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Judy's one of the, the heroes of what we did in Chicago. I'll, I'll tell you that story in a moment. But there are so many people here I want to thank. The Children's Home and Aid Society has been a group that I've learned so much from over the years. The outgoing CEO, the new CEO, Jane Quinn, just a phenomenal group. To Duffy Palmer, the New York Deputy Secretary of Education. To Randy Weingart. Where's Randy right here? Randy, thank you so much for your extraordinary leadership in this area and in so many areas. Michael Mulgrew, the incoming president of UFT, and thanks to all the local elected, elected officials here. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> this is a remarkable group. This is the 10th anniversary of the Lights On After School, something that sort of began in small corners of the country is really a, a national movement. And I think we're at a tipping point. I think we have a chance to fundamentally break through. I want to talk a little bit about the journey of where we've come. And I know this is the choir here, so I'll try not to do too much preaching. Um, but we have a, a momentous opportunity, I think, to make this the norm for every child in the country rather than an exception. I'd love just the, the cover of this, making every school a community school. That has to be our collective vision. That's got to be what this is about, not, not just the pockets of excellence, not the islands of excellence, not the islands of extended time, but really the norm for every single student, every single child. Let me sort of take you back a little bit and let you know why this, this, uh, this fight, this battle is so, so personal for me. Uh, my mother moved to Chicago with my dad in 1960. He was going to be a graduate student at the University of Chicago. And uh, she wanted to set up an after school tutoring program. And she went to a local school in a community. Uh, it was only about 10 blocks from where we lived, but it sort of crossed over one of these magical lines we know of in many urban areas that went from our very nice middle class community of Hyde Park to an all black, all poor uh, community of North Kenwood, Oakland. And one set up an after school program to work with students who are struggling. And she was told by that school that school closed at 2.30. You couldn't do anything after school. So she set up camp in the church basement across the street. Uh, that was in 1961. In 1991, 30 years later, uh, my sister and I had graduated from college, and both of us had finished playing basketball, got that out of our system, and wanted, <laughs> wanted to come back and start an after-school tutoring program. And we went to the same school in the same neighborhood. 30 years later, we're told, no, you couldn't do this. School closed at 2.30. And we ended up in the same church space with my mother. <laughs> literally. I mean, this is not, <laughs> it's not funny, literally. Um, so we sort of spent a lifetime literally looking across the street at a building that had great classrooms, that eventually had a computer lab, that had a library. There was this great resource for the community that the community was, was shut out of. And as we know across the country, in every rich, poor, black, white, Latino community, we have schools. In every school, there are classrooms, there are computer labs, there are libraries, there are gyms. Some have pools. And in far too many places, the community doesn't have access to them. And those schools don't belong to me. They don't belong to the principal. They don't belong to the board. They don't belong to the union. They belong to the community. And we have to think about using these great assets <coughs> to really change the life chances of our children. When I got the job leading the Chicago Public Schools, I decided to try and open up those schools. And uh, it, it was interesting, the, the, the battles and the culture change you, you had to overcome. The first thing is we were told, I said, why aren't more schools open after school? Well, I was told you couldn't do it because you, the engineers had to be there. You had to pay the engineers overtime, double pay. And schools couldn't afford it. And I understood schools were really stretched for resources. And so lots of folks said, we want to keep the schools open. We just can't do it. We can't afford, we can't afford to keep the engineers. 
So I decided to read the contract. And I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a contract uh, attorney by any stretch of imagination. But it's interesting, when you looked at the contract, it said schools could be kept open by the principal or by the principal's designee. It said nothing about the engineers. But that had been a myth that had been perpetuated for decades. Right? People really believed it. So we figured out that the principal could do it, the principal's designee could do it, it could be an assistant principal, it could be a teacher, it could be the executive director of the local Boys and Girls Club. It didn't have to be the engineer. And so we had to sort of get past that mindset that was absolutely pervasive. The second battle, and there had been a small set of community schools in Chicago when we started about six or seven, <coughs> the um, Hope Brothers Foundation and others had done a great job of funding, but there was lots of animosity towards keeping schools open by principals. It means more work, it's more difficult to manage, it's hard to figure out. And so what we tried to do with, with Judy's extraordinary support and a small set of other players is we put some of our money together and some private sector money and some philanthropic money together and we had schools compete for the right to open up schools, try to make it something of value rather than something, you know, we sort of debated, do we force schools to stay open? And we thought if we force schools to stay open, we'd be setting ourselves up for failure. And what started with about six schools grew over a couple of years to 150. It's remarkable progress. And at the end of the day, that number would have been closer to 600 because there was so much demand and we simply ran out of resources and ran out of time. Um, but it was an absolute culture change amongst everyone, amongst the adults, amongst the principals, amongst the community. Um, it was easily the best leverage money we spent for every dollar of the school system we were putting in. We were getting back five, six, seven dollars from the business community, from the philanthropic community, from the nonprofits, from the social service agencies, from the state, from the federal government. This is the best money any of us can spend. What do these schools do? What, what changes for students? We're fighting a lot of different battles as a society. We have to get dramatically better, and again, all of you know this. But we all are here because we feel this huge sense of urgency that we think there are far too many children who aren't getting what they need every day. If they don't get what they need, we perpetuate poverty and we perpetuate social failure. So we have to think very, very differently uh, about that. We have a dropout rate of 30% around the country. That's 1.2 million students coming onto the streets every single year. You know, they're not all going to the MBA. Um, Bill Gates isn't recruiting our dropouts from ninth and 10th grade to go work at Microsoft. They basically have no good options out there. So how do we start to change this equation? A couple of things have changed, and all of you know this in our society. First of all, go back 20 or 30 years, mom was usually home at 2.30 with <coughs> a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That has changed for everybody, rich, poor, black, white, Latino. Whether it's two-parent working families, whether it's single moms today working one, two, even three jobs trying to make ends meet, whether it's too many of our children, unfortunately, basically going home to no parent families, all of our children need our schools to open longer hours. The idea of the schools being open six hours a day, five days a week, nine months a year is obsolete. It's based upon sort of a 19th century model. It simply doesn't work. That time from three o'clock to six o'clock, three o'clock to seven o'clock is a time of huge anxiety. We know, and this is true, unfortunately, absolutely true in Chicago and true in New York and true in all the communities you come from, our streets aren't as safe as we'd like them to be. And often schools really are these safe havens and communities. And for us to sweep students out onto the streets at a time when their parents aren't available to them simply makes no sense to me. And the more our schools become safe havens, the longer we have students, the more we can work with them and, and keep them safe. All of our students need to be accelerated academically. We can't, the best teachers can't do enough during the school day. So another hour, another hour and a half, another two hours of academic enrichment, of work in the computer lab, of work in debate, whatever it might be, giving our students a chance to build those skills, build upon what's going on, we have to do. Our students just desperately need more time. Our students need a reason to be excited about going to school every day. And for every child, it's not gonna be algebra trick, or it's not gonna be biology. It might be robotics, it might be debate, it might be dance, it might be chess, it might be yearbook. All those things, if we're serious about reducing the dropout rate, what happens extracurricularly is often the best hook, the best way to capture students' hearts, and more importantly, you know, their, their hearts and their minds, and keep them coming to school every day. Our schools can't provide all those things during the regular school day. We all wish they could, we're working on it, we're trying to get better, but the fact of the matter is the only way we provide students with a well-rounded um, you know, set of opportunities is by thinking very differently about time. Before school, lunchtime, after school, Saturdays, weekends, over the summer. One of the things I've traveled the country that I hear the most is a real, uh, a real anger 
amongst teachers and parents about the narrowing of the curriculum and the no child left behind, that we just sort of teach what gets tested. The only way we broaden that curriculum is to think about how we use time differently and providing that set of opportunities, not just during the school day and during the after school as well. Finally, we have to think very differently about how we engage not just children, but families. And it's amazing to me as I try and listen to students, young, young children, middle school, high school, our young people are desperately looking for better ways to be engaged with their parents. And the more our schools become community centers, not just open for children, but to their older brothers and sisters and to families, GED classes, ESL classes, family literacy nights, potluck dinners, whatever it might be, <coughs> the more families are engaged and the more families become the hearts, the more schools become the hearts of family life, the better our students are going to do. It's amazing for all of us that think teenagers want more freedom and more flexibility. Uh, we used to survey our teens in Chicago. One of the most startling findings, one of the most heartbreaking, was one of their biggest requests was they wanted more time with their parents. We have to provide vehicles. We have to provide opportunities for that to happen. I went last night to uh, I have a kindergartner and a second, second grader. Uh, kindergarten last night, they, in their school, they had sort of a night celebrate. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what they're celebrating. I think they're celebrating the diversity of the school, just the opening of the school year. Well, they had all the children, all the families, just had a great dinner together, kids running around together, chance to meet parents. That's got to become the norm. We, schools have to welcome parents in. And we know in many places, parents haven't, frankly, been welcome in schools, either during the school day or after school. If schools can truly become the centers of community life, great, great things are going to happen for our children. So if we do our work well, what changes? Lots of data out there. Academic improvement goes up significantly. You see greater rate of gains. You see dropout rates go down. You see reductions in truancy. You see increases in attendance. One of the most interesting findings that I didn't anticipate, but it makes a lot of sense that we saw in Chicago in our community schools, is we saw reductions in mobility. Chicago's like many places. We have a, a 90% poor uh, student population, like, like New York and other places. Our, pa our parents, our families are often one step ahead of the landlord, and particularly given this tough economic climate. They're sort of moving place to place, month to month. But in schools that had community schools, we didn't eradicate poverty. We didn't eradicate that transiency. We gave families a reason to come back to that school. They were still moving, but they stayed attached to that school. There was something happening there. And for children that desperately need some sense of stability, they need some anchor in their lives, community schools are huge, huge ways to do that. And I think so many of us are fighting huge mobility rates. It's hard for teachers to teach when they're seeing, you know, when the child's in their class for three, four, five months out of the year. It's a little bit difficult for a teacher to have an impact there. If we're keeping children, particularly children from disadvantaged communities, in schools with their teachers year after year, then I think we can really do something special. So I think the dividends are huge. The question now is if we know it works, and again, we're all here because we know it works, how do we really take this to scale? And uh, I think as we go forward, we're trying to push and challenge the status quo in a number of different areas. We're trying to invest and change sort of how our department does business. We're trying to invest unprecedented discretionary resources into states, into districts, into nonprofits that are willing to challenge the status quo and help us get dramatically better. So we have $4 billion into the Race to the Top Fund. And we're going to work with states and districts that are going to do two things, close the achievement gap and raise the bar for all students. I don't know how schools and districts and states do that without thinking differently about time, without thinking about the concept of community schools. I don't know how we improve achievement if we don't think just about the academic needs of our students, but the social and emotional and physical needs of our students, thinking about attaching health care clinics to schools and having them be one-stop shops. And so there's a huge amount of resources we're going to put on the table <coughs> for states and districts to think very, very differently about student achievement. We also are putting unprecedented resources on the table to turn around chronically underperforming schools. $3.5 billion in school improvement grants. We have many extraordinarily high performing schools in our country. Best schools in our country are the best in the world. We have a lot of schools in the middle that are improving and getting a little bit better each year. We also unfortunately have some schools that need dramatic change. We have 200, sorry, 2,000 high schools <coughs> in this country that produce half our nation's dropouts half of that 1.2 million every year. Those 2,000 high schools, and really not that big a number, we have 95,000 schools. Those 2,000 high schools produce 75% of our dropouts from our minority community, our African American, Latino, young boys and girls. That is absolutely unacceptable. So we're putting $3.5 billion on the table 
to work with states and districts and nonprofits that wanted to fundamentally turn around those schools and do something different. I don't see how those schools don't turn around if we keep doing business the same way. I don't see how those schools turn around if we don't significantly change the amount of time that we're engaging children, families, and communities in the life of that school. Huge opportunity there. We have $650 million in the Invest in Innovation Fund to work with districts and directly with nonprofits that are partnering ways to do two things, to close the achievement gap and to raise the bar. And then finally, based upon Jeff Canada's extraordinary work here in, here in uh, New York, uh, we're going to start relatively small, $10 million in planning grants, but we want to replicate the Harlem Children's Zone in neighborhoods around the country. We want to put hundreds of millions of dollars into that over the time, starting with a small set of districts to plan for a year and, and really grow it. So I say all that to say that the, that the <coughs> amount of resources we can put behind thinking differently about time has never been greater. And what we need is for all of you to think about how you take what's working to scale, how you have open and honest conversations when things aren't working and aren't having an impact on student achievement. And when, you know, this is all about raising graduation rates, reducing dropout rates, and making sure a much higher percentage of our high school graduates are prepared either for college or for the world of work. And collectively, the passion, the expertise, the leadership in the room, I think can help us fundamentally break through. We can't come back here two or three years from now and say we're heroes that dropout rates from down from 30% to 28%. That doesn't change outcomes for the country. The battle for us is how do we as a country get from 30% to zero absolutely as fast as we can. We all know the world has changed. I talked 30 years ago, church here in true in New York, it's true in Chicago, 30 years ago, there really was an acceptable dropout rate. It was really okay. You could drop out of Chicago public schools at 16 and go work in the stockyards and steel mills and get a good job and own your own home and support a family. Those jobs are distant memory from the bygone era. There are no good jobs in the legal economy in today's society. There are almost no good jobs for a high school graduate. It's got to be some form of higher education, four-year universities, two-year community colleges, trade, technical, vocational training, whatever it might be. K to 12 has to be simply a starting point in the education journey, not an ending point. If we can collectively engage our young people, and I'm particularly focused on our young children who come from tough backgrounds, who might not have all the resources at home, who might not have two parents at home, if we can collectively think very, very differently about how we engage them, not six hours a day, but 12, 13, 14 hours a day, not five days a week, but seven days a week, not nine months out of the year, but 12 months out of the year, I am convinced, and I've seen it throughout my lifetime, I am convinced that children from the toughest, poorest communities can have extraordinary outcomes, can go on to do great, great things. I've been lucky enough to see that all my life. The question is, how do we make that experience the norm rather than the exception? I think your collective leadership, I think your collective hard work, I think the idea of every single school being a community school is a big part of the answer. And so let's sort of seize this moment. There are huge challenges. We know the problems. We can sort of stop admiring the problems, start talking about them. Let's roll up our sleeves. Let's work in different ways together. Let's take our federal resources, partner that at the local level, leverage this money to the maximum, and let's try and make this experience the norm. If we, be, if we do that, we all know here our children are more than meet us halfway. Thank you so much for your hard work. Thank you so much for your commitment. I'll take any questions you might have. Secretary has agreed to take some questions and we're, we're giving him a pin to wear every, this is our vision statement, every school a community school. Um, and so there are microphones uh, in both aisles here and there is one up in the balcony, although we're not, we can't really see you up there. So you can, you can let us know if you're, if you're up there. Um, and I know that the secretary has to leave promptly at 11. I put a clock up here so we can both keep an eye on it. So do you, far away. let's so far away. Hello? Okay. Are you upstairs? Oh. <laughs> Secretary Duncan, I, I can't that was just, a great, <laughs> I'm sorry. My name is Charles Ray. I'm a Teachers College alumnus. Go ahead, I'm sorry. First of all, I want to say that as the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Education, I think you are 
very realistic as to the issues that our educational leaders and teachers are, are confronting today. So I want to applaud you for that. My area is school finance. And so I'm very much interested on how we dust off uh, previous programs like Title I, um, the TRIO program, Upward Mount Talent Search, to enhance student development uh, in the 21st century, both at the federal level and at the local level. How do you envision that? I think the issue of not just school violence, but community violence is a devastating one. And uh, it was by far the, the toughest thing that I, I dealt with in Chicago. And uh, it was one of the areas where I was least successful. I was extraordinarily proud of our efforts to make our schools safer. But we were, uh, I'd say, largely failures, frankly, <coughs> reducing violence in the community. And what our children face going to and from every school every single day, what they face in the neighborhoods on the weekends, I think as a country, we're crazy on this issue. And so I think if, and we all know this, if children aren't safe, if they're not free of fear, they can't learn. It's hard to think about algebra trig and AP biology and going to college if you're literally trying to survive going from, you know, to and from school every single day. I had a lot of the young boys I work with talk about if I grow up, this is what I want to do. That's a really, really deep statement, not when I grow up, if I grow up, this is what I want to do. I had a nine-year-old girl write me a letter saying her goal was to be able to walk to the corner store safely. That was her goal in life, not to be a teacher, not to be a doctor, but to get to the corner store safely. So we have some huge, huge challenges. Um, I think we have to look at everything we do, every funding source to, you know, to think in very different ways and be creative and, and, uh, and break through on this. I will also tell you that I don't think money can begin to answer this question. And that uh, we have to do a number of different things. And let me just take a, a moment on this. And I, I don't begin to have all the answers on this one. Um, I think we have to have a national conversation about values and how do we instill in, in children, particularly children, again, from families where dad might be locked up and the mom might be on crack. How do we instill in those children uh, a love of others, a love of themselves, respect of others, respect of themselves? Um, we have to think about how we give young folks positive adults in their lives. And when we don't do that, the gangs are sitting on the streets and drug dealers every single day on every corner. And I think we are, in many places, being outcompeted and outworked and outhustled. And they're winning the battle and, and we're losing. Um, I went back a couple weeks ago to, to meet with a set of students from Fenger High School in Chicago, which is the high school where the, the young boy was tragically beaten to death. And uh, asked about 15 kids, great kids. You know, one boy talked about his mother drinking his life, her life away. Another girl talked about both her parents' dead being raised by, by a grandmother. Asked them, what do we need to break through on this? It was fascinating to me. These are 15, 16, 17-year-old kids. Every single kid, I said, blue sky, what can we do to fix this? Every single kid said, we need a mentor. We need an adult in our life who can help guide us where we need to go. So we don't have anybody there for us. They weren't looking for money. They weren't looking for, you know, we need a mentor. It's fascinating to, to hear what they, what they had to say. Um, I was in a high school a week ago in New Orleans when the high school reopened after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, this was a new one for me. They had more security guards than teachers. They had 40 security guards and 36 teachers. Um, when you have that kind of mentality, you're grooming students to be institutionalized. You're grooming them to go to jail. That school, in two years, has made dramatic progress. They've gone from about 40 security guards down to four. So my point is to say this is not about more security. It's not about more metal detectors. We have to do a little bit of that. It's really about changing a culture. <laughs> changing a culture and a mindset and instilling in students a respect for themselves and ultimately respect for each other. So we need to look at every resource, every funding part, but if we don't get to that values conversation, if we don't meet students who are at risk at a very real level on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I think we're kidding ourselves on this one. Hello. I'm over here. Yes, sir. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can see you. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you again. Uh, we spoke briefly at the EEP. Uh, conference and um, uh, Kim from your office has been receptive. Uh, what we're asking for is, is for you, uh, your office anyway, to be more responsive to a segment that you refer to that you think is key, uh, which is the community. Um, personally, I'm 
are formed in independent parents' organizations, uh, organizations, and we support parents and communities uh, around the city. And we also have some support of uh, parents in, um, in New Orleans, uh, specifically the Dryades uh, Y, which was the first school that opened up and had more security guards than, than teachers. But what I'm talking about is, is central here. And I've raised five daughters, I'm out of the projects, I raised five daughters successfully to college. And we've been an advocate. You know, I graduated from the law school here. I was in uh, DC in 63 uh, with King and so forth. And I, and I experienced and know the uh, history of the Ocean Hill Brownsville um, situation in New York City, which reflected um, the, I, I guess it was the report on civil disturbances at circa 68. I don't need to go into that. But the, the problem that we have here is the politics of education, uh, whether it's unionism, whether it's the politics in higher education, et cetera, basically excludes inadvertently, intentionally, the community. And in order to change the culture with respect to the children that you're talking about, uh, Bill Cosby was here and, and spoke very graphically about, uh, with Pedro Nogueira, uh, spoke very graphically about cultural competency and inclusion. And I'm talking about at all levels. And, you know, I'll get to the question real quick. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but but this, is, this, 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 this is a, a central thing, and it's a central problem. It's not about governance, and it's not about funding. But in order to change the attitude, dropout rates, et cetera, you're going to have to respect parents and include them. In New York City, 900,000 and 1.1 million kids are black and Puerto Rican. Beg your pardon? The, the point is, the point, the question, I'm, I'm being asked to tell the question and not preach, which I'll do. And that is, what can we do with you directly to overcome the exclusion that we have with the politics, particularly in New York? I, I got it's it. long listed. And, and to deal, deal directly with your. Got your, it. Well, your, again, I, I can't repeat this enough. Our department has north of $10 billion in discretionary resources. Secretary Page, my predecessor two times ago, two, two, two previous secretaries, had $18 million. So we've gone from $18 million to $10 billion. We have never had so many discretionary resources. And all we want to do is invest in what works. So if you folks can demonstrate how you're closing the achievement gap, how you're raising the bar, how more students are going to college, you have never had a larger opportunity to expand that work. Be clear, you have to show us it works. It can't just be the good intentions, good faith, good ideas. But if what's working is making a difference, we want to take that to scale. And this is why I'm so ho hopeful, despite all the challenges, we've never had more great partnerships. We've never had more pockets of excellence around the country. We want to shine a spotlight on that. We want to replicate it. And this is a moment of opportunity. Yes, good morning. My name is Mariana Vergara. I work with Dr. Gordon in comprehensive education. Uh, what we do, I was so happy to hear you about what you were describing the culture that is called habitus. And that is what we work in comprehensive education. And I was very scared when you were talking about districts, states, and nonprofits, because we need to really put some money in parents. Because <coughs> when we go to the schools, we don't have a voice then we need to make sure there is a balance. I worked for the Department of Education representing the state when no child left behind with the schools. And parents, they do whatever. You can give the money to the states and it's not going to happen with accountability. We need to even the representation. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I, I do know what you okay, mean. Okay, and yeah. with that sense, talking his point about politics, this institutionalized discrimination that is happening within the schools, and nobody talks about it. The only way to address that <coughs> is by training parents how to navigate those systems. And that way we avoid what they are doing to our kids. Yeah. Then I ask you to please reach out to Dr. Gordon and ask him about habitus, and that way we can change that perception that teachers have of our children or parents take or kids that they don't build resilience in order to address that. <laughs> your, your point's really well taken. And I'll, I'll just say that, you know, 
education has been desperately underfunded and a lack of resources. We're lucky enough to have a president who is passionate about this and bipartisan support in Congress. We have $100 billion in new money for education. My budget doubled. That never happens. <laughs> no. Budgets never double, ever. Business, nonprofits, education doesn't happen. We've never moved more resources. Having said that, we will never have enough money. But more importantly, we have to talk openly and honestly about adult dysfunction. And often, adult dysfunction has been what's stood in the way of students learning. We all have to change our behavior. We all have to move outside our comfort zones. And I've said repeatedly, we're being self, very self-critical and looking in the mirror, and that starts with us. We, as the Department of Education, have been part of the problem. We've been this big compliance-driven bureaucracy. We're trying to change our business to be the engine of innovation. So all of us have to do some things differently if we expect children to, to uh, have better results. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Secretary upstairs. Duncan. It's a real pleasure to see you to here. See you. Your friends and fans from Illinois uh, send their greetings. Uh, my question for you is, what can we do at the national and the local uh, level to make this happen. This is our moment. We have the leadership in place at the national level. We have a movement that is coast to coast and now international. What would you advise the nonprofits, particularly as partners with the schools, what would be that next step yeah. to sustain and advance this agenda? Well, I think, again, it is this moment of opportunity. The race to top guidance is almost the final proposals, final uh, piece will be out in a couple weeks. We're vetting now the school improvement grant um, ideas, and that proposal will be out soon. Jim Shelton, and he's here, has done a great, great job. His Investing in Innovation Fund, we're working on that as well. Now's the time to think about partnering you know, with districts, with universities, with states, whatever it is, to take what's working to scale. And if you know, we can get great proposals that demonstrate what's working, that's what we want to invest in. My only caution would be, to me, this stuff has to work. And so don't, I'm much more interested in quality than quantity. So if you're in eight schools, so say you can go to 80, I'm not sure if you can do that. If you can go from eight schools to 16, maybe that's possible. That's still doubling what you're doing. It's hard to do. So at the end of the day, what's really important to me is that, and this is you know, maybe a little selfish, we have to keep having access to discretionary resources going forward. I think that's how we drive change in this country. We have to stop just doing formula-based stuff, which perpetuates the status quo. The only way I get race to the top two two years from now is if race the top one works. And if we, well, if we spend- We'll make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Don't forget the upstairs, please. Oh, I'm sorry, upstairs, you're up, I'm sorry. That's all right, we'll, I'm we'll, Irene we'll Sterling go, we'll from go, we'll the- We'll go clockwise, we'll go upstairs and Irene Sterling from the Patterson Education Fund, and I have a suggestion and a, and a question. The suggestion is, as far as parental involvement is concerned, is that if, states and districts were required to have a line item in their budgets for how they spend that 1% parent money, we'd have much more accountability and much clearer programming uh, that, that parents do. The second piece that I wanna um, ask about is with the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind, how do we get rid of the SES providers so that we can take that money and invest it in uh, community schools that really work? Let, let, me, let me take those in order. On the first one, I, I hear you on the requirement. I will say the flip side, and I always try and be honest, again, this has got to be less about pointing fingers and more look, you know, looking in the mirror and self-reflection as well. Um, that money can be much better spent. There are times when I saw in Chicago, it's interesting, many of that money, uh, a lot of that money often seemed to go to conferences that happened to me in Las Vegas. And um, so I wasn't sure if that was of the best benefit to children. I think the adults may have had a pretty good time in Las Vegas. Um, but was that really benefiting what's going on? So I think this idea of mutual accountability and shared responsibility is very, very important, and we have to openly and honestly look at that. Um, I think, again, I think it's a little hard to blanket. I think there are some SES providers that do a great job, and there are some that do a horrendous job. And so what we have to look at is what's working, what's making a difference. And uh, I, uh, as you may know, fought the, my, my previous employer, the uh, Department of Education, very hard to say let the district tutor, let us work with the community, let us do some things and not just give all the money to the private providers. But what we just need is more things that work. And so I, you know, do we need to get rid of every SES provider? I don't think we need to do that. Those that aren't performing, those that aren't, those that aren't making a difference, those just see this as a profit center, not a way to change students' lives, they need to go. And so I don't think there's one solution in any of this. We need to look at a multitude of solutions and things that are working, let's take it to scale. Things that aren't working, let's be open and honest about that. 
Good morning, Secretary Duncan. Um, I'm Sarah Sneed. I'm with the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving and here with a great team from Hartford today where we are passionate about building community schools one school at a time. Uh, we're really appreciative of your presence here today. And my question is, uh, what do you think are the most strategic investments that philanthropy can make to partner with you and to further this vision? Community foundations, corporate foundations. That's, 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 a, that's a really profound question. And to me, it's not just partnering with me, but it's partnering at the local school level, the local district level. The biggest thing from, again, this was easily, easily the most leveraged, best use of money that I had in Chicago. And everybody wants return on investment, and everybody got that. And everybody who put in a dollar got $5 in return. Everyone has scarce resources now. You know, uh, endowments got hit in, in the philanthropic community. No one has as much resources as we need. What I would challenge foundations to do would be to invest in those places that are really serious about this. And frankly, some places aren't. And this is not you know, trying to make it force this in. Again, we didn't force after school programming into schools that weren't ready. And uh, foundations can't force us into districts that aren't ready but where folks are ready to invest significantly to leverage funding at every level, state, local, federal, nonprofit side, philanthropic side, corporate side. And the biggest thing for me that I was so, so lucky in Chicago is to stay the course. What you see so often in philanthropy is they get onto a great idea, they do it for three years, and then they move to the next sexy idea. This has to be what you guys are doing. I'm just so proud of Children's Aid's leadership. This has to become the norm. This has to become every school. So this is not something that you can invest in for three years and have an exit strategy. This has to be where you stay the course for the long haul. Hold, hold everyone accountable for results. That would be my advice. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Secretary Duncan. My name is Mary Martinez, and I'm a board member on the Los Angeles Unified School District, and I'm here with our board president, Monica Garcia. And we want to invite you to Los Angeles to see the work <laughs> that we are doing in Los Angeles. But our question is, what is the Obama administration doing to work with other departments, such as the Department of Labor, Department of Human and Health Services, to bring resources to help schools? Yeah, that, that's, a gr that's a great question. And, um, <laughs> as I said earlier, and again, we were part of the problem historically. When I talk about adult dysfunction, I'll give you a number of different examples. Um, <laughs> much, of, much of the early childhood work doesn't come out of our department. It comes out of HHS. We have to do a much better job together. And I will tell you, maybe we're just all on our best behavior or still early on a honeymoon, but I've been just unbelievably impressed. And I wouldn't say this if it, if it wasn't true, with whether it's Kathleen Sebelius, you know, whether it's uh, Labor, or whether it's HUD. All these guys are just trying to get stuff done. So I'll walk through. There's a whole different level of partnership around early childhood education. We have unprecedented resources coming in there, and we're just going to work together. No egos, no silos, whatever. When we think about promised neighborhoods and where we go, we're spending lots of time talking with Sean Donovan about how we really invest in areas where he's investing as well, so how we literally help to rebuild the neighborhood as we go forward. Hilda Solis at, at Labor has been a phenomenal partner. We're really thinking through stuff, not just K-12, to but with higher education, community colleges, and having that link um, into that community. Uh, food, we've got to feed our kids better. We don't control school lunches. That's Tom Vilsack. And uh, we're working really, really hard with him to figure out how we better help our kids eat and how we better educate families so we sort of fight this obesity uh, challenge that I think is a, a big, big issue in so many of our communities. And so, you know, we're still learning. We're still feeling our way. But I can tell you I've been unbel uh, uniformly, unbelievably appreciative of the support and commitment across the board. And I think we can do some things in a different way. Thank you. Come Thanks. to Los Angeles. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. Hi there, my name is Cindy Ness. I'm from the Schuyler Center for Analysis and Advocacy. I also work with the uh, Governor's Early Childhood Advisory Council here in, in New York State. Um, first of all, I think that this is the first time in, in my lifetime that I, that I could recall there being both good ideas, uh, political will, and money uh, to uh, fund the good ideas, and I think that's the winning combination. So I think we're really in a good position to do something good. Um, I'm particularly interested in early learning, and there's uh, the potential through the Early Learning Challenge Grant to put a lot of money into early learning across the United States. And I'm wondering how the administration um, thinks about creating sort of a seamless connection between early learning and then K through 12. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hugely important area. We've brought in uh, Jacqueline Jones, who you might know, came from New Jersey and did this masterfully. And again, we talk about adults not getting along, the fight between early childhood and you know, primary and K to 12 has been part of the problem. And so we have a chance, again, with you know, unprecedented billions of dollars to invest in places that are going to break through in two areas, dramatically increase access and dramatically improve quality. And really, really take this, you know, this is glorified babysitting and we're not really getting where we need to go. Why I think this is so important, everyone here knows this, is that in education, we all are in the catch-up game. We have universities doing way too much remedial classes. We have too many high schools making up for what didn't happen in elementary. Elementary making up for what, you know, what didn't happen early. We have to get out of the catch-up game. If every child could hit kindergarten ready to learn and ready to read and with the literacy and socialization skills intact, it would change the national conversation. So what we do for our, not just three and four year olds, we're going to our babies, our ones and twos and threes. If we can get them ready to learn, ready to read, entering kindergarten, that changes everything. And we're gonna try and invest in places that wanna do that. Just to follow up, does that mean that Race to the Top is also interested in pre-K? Um, Race to the Top does not have that as its own criteria. We have a separate bill that's passed the House before the Senate now that provides an additional $8 billion that's for early childhood challenge, challenge grants. grants. Yep, that's the vehicle there. So um, this, is, this is actually not a cheerleading question, Secretary Duncan, but he has, in, in my experience in Washington in the last several months, I have seen a real openness in the Department of Education, and a lot of it is because of the Secretary, and I want to thank you for that. Um, my question is this, which is, as I travel the country and see places where they have brought community schools to scale, like in Rockland County, um, with the 15 years, I was just talking to Harry Cornell, um, where they have pulled together the BOCES, all the different community school boards, um, the county legislature, they've all done that kind of work and coordination, but it has actually taken the kind of steel will and courage and conscience of, of a county legislator like Harriet to do that. In Cincinnati, where they saw that it was really important as a way of where they saw that charter schools were actually providing these services and they made the argument that the public schools should be providing those services too, an argument that I know my successor, Michael Mulgrew, has been making in New York as well. My question is this. The number one issue that we've seen that stops the kind of work that you just talked about with community schools is not money, and in some ways not the use of time, but the lack of coordination. And I am wondering whether or not, particularly since there's lots and lots of different districts who are starting to look at the issue of mayoral control, where mayors also have tremendous authority over other kinds of services, whether or not the department and or in law or in regulation can find a way to incentivize that coordination. So it's not always coming bottom up, but there's a way yeah. of trying to make those dollars and make the coordination um, work from top down. Right. Well, first of all, before I try, it's a great question. Before I answer your question, let's give Randy a round of applause for her extraordinary <laughs> leadership. And, um, at the national level, what she is doing to do the right thing, both by teachers and by children, is extraordinary. And it takes huge courage. It takes le huge leadership. And I, you know, again, wouldn't say it if I didn't mean it from my heart. I am really, really lucky to have her as a partner. So Randy, thank you so much thank for what you. you're doing every single day. Um, it's a, I don't have an easy answer to the question. I think, you know, I've advocated for mayoral control. I'm sure not everyone in this room likes that position. Uh, but um, it's something that I think is a piece of the answer. It, I think I've, I'm just trying to, as I've gone to different places, I've seen different things. In Syracuse, where the whole place is getting right. behind this, you've had a great outside philanthropic partner, and you've had Syracuse University sort of wrap exactly. their arms around the community. And so I don't know if it can be one, it, can it only just be the mayor? I don't think so, there's many places, but your point is can we make sure it's coming from somewhere? And exactly. whether it's a university, whether it's a philanthropic community, whether it's from political leadership, it doesn't have to be a mayor, it can be a county <laughs> supervisor, whatever it might be. But your point is that if it's just ground up, if there isn't some buying at the top, it's not sustainable. Exactly. And so thinking through that is, um, is a really important thing for us to do. Thanks. Thank you. I'll do two more, sorry, one, then one up top, then I have to go, I apologize. The last two. Hi, Secretary Duncan. My name is Danielle Damari. I work in the New York City Department of Ed, and I'm so inspired by your leadership, so thank you so much. Uh, it's a slightly similar question. Uh, in the department I work, 
in collaboration with different city agencies and nonprofits to implement after school programs. So I'm very familiar with a lot of the operational challenges that you mentioned. But I'm also cognizant of how many constituents that we have as partners to help address the dropout crisis. Uh, I'm wondering what your advice is uh, to help enable us to work better as a community to implement community schools. Um, how can we find that qualitative partnership uh, that, that I think often uh, eludes us? You know, how can, it, it's, it's very similar to Randy's question, is how can the mayor help you know, involve more agencies, nonprofits, philanthropics, uh, corporations, mm -hmm. small businesses, so that we could all address this holistically and strategically? Yeah, and again, I'm struggling to come up with really succinct answers on these. Let me, let me just say that what I think we need to do as a country, like, I don't know why we are still building boys and girls clubs and YMCAs. I think we should take all our money out of bricks and mortar and put it into kids. And so, and, and this is not a critique of them, it's a critique of us because we haven't opened our doors to them. And so I think, you know, if, what if we run the schools from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock and those great nonprofits and social service agencies run the schools from 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock? And so it's not just about, this is all not just about more money, it's about reallocating the money. Don't charge them rent, give them the building for a dollar, you know, figure it out. Uh, again, they're not trying to make money off of this. And so I think this is really a very, very different mindset. I think in every community there are great nonprofits, the great social service agencies, they're all working out of, you know, church basements and storefronts. Let's get them out of those places and let's co-locate services and get a critical mass of things out of school. Again, these physical resources, these physical buildings, I just think are so extraordinarily valuable. And so what I think it takes is almost a mapping at, you know, school, literally, at, and you've got a lot of schools here in New York, but it's really mapping school by school. What are those community assets in that three, four, five block radius mm -hmm. that we could bring into our, you know, hold, again, make sure they're real, make sure they're doing a good job. How can we bring them into our buildings and give them a chance to operate there, take that 10 or 15% that they're spending on bricks and mortar and rent and put that all into kids and programming. And if you do that systemically school by school, which is a lot of hard work, um, I think that's how we get there. But I think it's at that local level, really figuring out what those community assets are and saying, do you want to be part of the solution and do it together as a school? Thank you. Thank you. La last one upstairs. Thank you, and I, I want to underscore our thanks for your taking questions. I was at a forum last night where I said what I'm about to say and asked um, to Deputy Secretary Mayor Walcott, and I said, I hope I can say the same thing to Secretary Duncan tomorrow. So thank you for taking questions. What I said to him uh, is that when you look at our 30% dropout rate, the, really, uh, the reason is the children cannot read. I formed something called the Right to Read Project based on my own experience with two dyslexic children. And dyslexia affects 20% of the population and falls through the cracks. It is not addressed by special ed. And the only way you can help your children is forking over amounts of, say, $20,000 to get help on the outside. So I would urge you to think about, or let me ask you, <laughs> here's my question. Could you reconsider the Race to the Top funding and think of a Marshall Plan for reading for, as you say, in, in the community setting, everyone right through adulthood. The city of Buffalo is doing this right now. To take that money and make sure every child is truly reading, and I'm not talking about phonics versus whole language. It goes deeper and further than that. The programs exist. They are on a list from the New York City and State Dyslexia Association, for instance. The programs exist. They just need to brought to scale, and the entire country would then be literate within 10 years. It's a good question. Again, I sort of, I, I worry a bit when we just have one answer to what I think are really complex problems. So is reading hugely, hugely, hugely important, foundational? Absolutely. Is it the only thing we need to do? I would argue it's not the only thing we need to do. And again, how we provide kids with some sense of hope, how we provide kids with adults in their lives who care about them. So yes, the country, we need to do a much, much better job of teaching children to read. Um, we need to invest there. To me, and again, this is where it's important for folks to think about, it's not just race the top. We spend as a country, a Title II money, over $3 billion a year on teacher professional development. You ask teachers how much of that is benefiting them, you usually get some uneasy laughter. Um, there's, there's not a lot of uh, bang for the buck there. So I think in everything we're doing, we have to reconsider how we're spending current scarce resources now to do it. The final thing I'll say, which is a little bit broader, one of the things I've worried a lot about is that I think every teacher today has to be a teacher of special ed. This idea of just having separate special education teachers dealing with these children in a closet in the basement doesn't work. 
every teacher has to be equipped with the skills. And so to me, this is part of a, a, a larger conversation about a comprehensive way of much better equipping teachers to deal with the tremendously diverse and challenging situations they face. I have to run. Thank you so much for your hard work. Thank you for your leadership. Thanks for having me today.